Britain, 3000 BC. For the first time in history, man is beginning to leave his permanent mark on Britain's landscape. Giant funerary barrows, monolithic standing stones, ritualistic henge earthworks. Did the people who erected these gigantic structures think that they would still be standing 5,000 years on. Regardless, these incredible works of earth and stone have proven the test of time, and continue to inspire and baffle onlookers for millennia. Following the end of the most recent ice age, the water held up in glaciers is melting, causing sea levels to rise. This drastically changes the landscape of Britain, and indeed the world. The land bridge which once connected Britain to mainland Europe begins to fall below sea level, cutting off the British Isles, along with its flora and fauna. So, what would have life been like for people living in this Neolithic world 5,000 years ago? In 3000 BC, the landscape of Britain wouldn't have looked too terribly different to today. Vast grasslands, shallow wooded valleys, and rolling hills would have been a typical sight to behold. A peaceful, most definitely tranquil countryside, ideal for mammals such as deer, boar, and sheep. By this time, Man had far distanced himself from his caveman ancestry of Homo erectus or Homo habilis, and by now are fully evolved into the modern Homo sapiens sapiens which we are today. Over in the Middle East and parts of Mediterranean Europe, farming and domestication of animals has already become a common part of agricultural life for thousands of years. However, due to the recent submersion of a Britannic European land bridge, along with the similar flooding of the famous lost landmass of Doggerland, meant that the people of Britain were somewhat cut off from the progression of mainland Europe and its neighbours. And as such, gathering food by agricultural farming means arrived in Britain a lot later than in mainland Europe. A rather interesting consequence of farming being the main staple food source was that food such as cereal, crop, and wheat stunt your growth. Indeed, people from countries most known for farming and agriculture are also among the shortest. It did not take long for agriculture and domestication of livestock to become the most popular means of gathering food in Britain, and soon large swathes of the British landscape had been adapted for optimal farming conditions. Huge deforestation programs, alongside slash and burn techniques, transformed Britain into an agricultural haven. It is recently generally accepted that more of Britain's landscape was dedicated to agriculture during the Bronze Age than it is today. Now that the inhabitants of Britain had largely solved the demand for food problem, they found more time to learn new things, create a better living standard, and to query their existence. So begins a new age, the descendant of the Paleolithic and the Mesolithic Age, the Neolithic Age. Possibly the most popular term for this would be the Stone Age, or, more specifically, the New Stone Age. But, if you're more of a serious historian, you may prefer the more academically accurate term, the Age of the Beaker People, known as such due to the prior invention of clay-fired beaker-shaped vessels used for food gathering and storage, finding their way to the British Isles. With the fields toiled, the firewood collected, and the livestock fed. People tend to find themselves with free time on their hands for the first time since the dawn of man. With this precious opportunity, 
they set to work immediately improving themselves, learning new skills, creating new inventions, negotiating trade with neighbouring tribes, or indeed neighbouring regions or further afield, and, perhaps most importantly, leaving their mark on Earth's landscape. The earliest man-made forms of expression that we know of today are paintings, at roughly 15,000 years old, the famous cave paintings of Grotte de Ruffinac in France are perhaps the most extensive and most beautiful of all ancient paintings to survive today. But around 10,000 years later, man wants to leave a more solid memento for future descendants to remember them by. Standing stones, dolmen, barrows, mines and henges are among the most notable man-made structures which continue to adorn the British countryside today. Standing stones, or menhirs, are stones set vertically into the ground, most commonly found in Western Europe, where around 50,000 standing stones remain in situ. We do not know why these giant standing stones were erected, nor do we know exactly when the process first began, and we commonly contribute these structures to ritualistic and overly religious roots. However, it is also just as plausible that these hefty upright monoliths were used as a permanent signpost, either guiding travellers or traders, or perhaps an attempt to ward off unwanted invaders, warning them that an advanced tribe already occupy these lands, and are capable of working together to assemble these incredibly heavy lumps of stone, and therefore not a people to be trifled with. Some folklore will tell you that standing stones may have once been real people, who have since been turned to stone with the help of dark magic. Granted, some do indeed have a vague resemblance of human figures with heads and shoulders. Barrows or tumuli are among the oldest known method of celebrated burial in human history. Either circular, oval, or triangular in construction, these large earthen mounds are burial tombs hosting either single or multiple chambers inside. They commonly consist of stone supports underneath the soil, and large stone slabs making up an entrance and door of the mouth of the tomb while the intended functions of other Neolithic stone structures continues to elude us, we know that barrows were made to celebrate the dead, acting as a temple in their honour. People living throughout the Neolithic period had a much different relationship with death as we do today. Death from disease, injury or old age was much more accepted as a natural part of the cycle of life meaning that the average person would come face to face with mortality much more commonly. Indeed, archaeological evidence tells us that the people used to eat, rest and go about their daily life in the immediate presence of these barrows, either sleeping in neighbouring chambers or indeed directly on top of the buried dead. All evidence points to this practice of living amongst the dead as a sign of utmost respect. With the vast majority of skeletons found buried in the fetal position, which assumes they had been wrapped in fabrics, as if to keep them warm in the next life, as well as having multiple possessions buried alongside them. Perhaps the most famous barrow is West Kennet Long Barrow in Avebury, which makes up part of a much larger historical site featuring many more ancient monuments, called the Avebury World Heritage Site. West Kennet Long Barrow is known to have housed nearly 50 people during its time as a tomb, although many skeletons found inside the chambers had been partially disassembled, particularly for skulls. Although we cannot know for sure why certain bones had been removed, it is believed that they were stolen by 17th to 19th century grave robbers, who believed that ancient bones ground up in elixirs could cure ailments such as gout, epilepsy, 
and fever. Despite now being covered from top to bottom in earth, walls of chalk would have aligned the sides of a barrow, giving it a look similar to a Viking longhouse. The chamber would have also been adorned with artefacts such as pots, flints, tools, and jewellery placed around the deceased body, which would have been a mix of owner's possessions and other people's offerings. Also known as cromlechs, or quoits, dolmen are particularly intriguing man-made stone formations. Due to their characteristic build of two or three upright stones, with a giant stone slab placed on top like a lid, which is called a capstone, giving the Neolithic structures a table-like appearance. These structures are found in most places of the world, and are most common in Cornwall and South Korea. However, these similarities bears no connection between each place. Dolmen are actually the skeletal remains of a barrow, where the earth mound has long since weathered away over millennia, leaving the rectangular tomb entrance protruding from the ground. The earliest known dolmen are found in Western Europe, and date to around 5000 BC. St. Livan's burial chamber in the Vale of Glamorgan, southern Wales, is subject to a rather intriguing folklore. Built over 1,500 years before Stonehenge, and located in the accursed field, each Midsummer's Eve the capstone is said to turn three times, then the stones walk through the field and down to the river to bathe, before returning to their original location. If you've seen my video on the Great Orb of Landudno, or perhaps the segment about Grimes' graves in my Origins of Norwich video, then you will be already well versed in knowledge of Neolithic and Bronze Age mines in Britain. Mining is one of Britain's very first organised industries. The manpower and skill set required to operate some of the mine networks within the British Isles couldn't have been achieved without a high degree of organisation and efficiency. So much so, that as early as 2000 BC, Phoenician traders from the Mediterranean have been said to sail to the tin mines of Cornwall. The Greeks caught wind of this, and also began trading with the native miners of Cornwall, referring to them as Cassiderides. The Cassiderides remained somewhat of a myth which was known by people all across the known world, the name being linked to tin beyond the Mediterranean world, and not a single place. Herodotus doubted the existence of the Cassiderides, as the Phoenicians kept the location of these highly prized tin mines a closely guarded secret. In a later account, Pythias, the Greek geographer from Massalia, southern France, visited the miners of Balerium, Land's End, and their tin depot at Ictis in the 4th century BC. To this day, we still don't know the confirmed location of Ictis, itself being a highly mythologized location. However, experts currently believe it to be somewhere along either the Devon or Southern Cornwall coast, St. Michael's Mount being a key candidate. It wasn't until the Roman occupancy of Britain in the 1st century AD that the Cornish tin mines made the transition from mythology to reality for the people of the Mediterranean. During the height of their empire, the Romans had almost full control of the metal industry within the known world. This meant that the tin mines fell under the occupier's dominion, and were officially documented for the first time. But why were these tin mines so highly prized for millennia? Tin mixed with malachite or copper makes bronze, bronze being the first strong metal invented by mankind. The invention of bronze opened up all new possibilities for jewellery, bowls, cups, armour, blades and tools. This new creation, at the hands of man, completely changed the way people lived forevermore. Warfare, gathering timber, construction, agriculture and general quality of life were all escalated to a brand new level due to the additional strength, durability and the extended lifespan of these new tools. 
Tin is a very limited resource, occurring only in a few places across the known world, and the people all across this world wanted it. We cannot fathom how rich the people, who were possibly warlords, who claimed ownership of these tin and malachite mines were, or indeed how the wealth was distributed among the workers. Regardless, they are widely considered to be the richest people to have ever walked this earth. Taking a step back into the Neolithic Age, humans relied on stone, particularly flint, as the preferred material for a multitude of different tools. Flint hatchets, knives, arrowheads, spearheads, harpoon heads, and scrapers were used all across Europe during the Neolithic Age. Britain was a leading supplier of the best quality flint required for these tools. Just west of my hometown of Norwich, lay a field rippled in bumps. These are the remains of once vast mines, created during the Neolithic period, named Grimes Graves. Named as such by Saxons who later arrived in the area and saw the pits, now reclaimed by nature, and named the site Grimms Graven, which referred to the Masked One's Quarry, a pagan mythology. The people who created these ancient mines were on the hunt for a specific type of flint found deep underground, known as black flint. This is the strongest form of flint, found by digging into the floor stone level, deep below the surface, and was sold for a pretty penny all across Europe. To imagine that people as early as 5,000 years ago were trading overseas, as far as Germania, Central Europe, gives us key insight into the assumed complexity of life for these Neolithic people living in Britain, so far from the primitive caveman that they are often, rather unfortunately, portrayed as. Henges would be the most famous of all stone monuments from the Neolithic Age, mostly due to Stonehenge. Henges are commonly referred to as stone circles and are indeed a group of standing stones in a circle or oval, sometimes also made from wood rather than stone. Much like barrows, these stone circles offer a centre stage to the monument, and would commonly have an altar of sorts in the centre. The function of a henge is largely agreed as ritualistic, However, domestic artefacts found within and nearby these circular monuments provide hints that they may have had more of a rounded role in Neolithic society, perhaps an ancient equivalent of a town centre. When discussing henges, the popular go-to is indeed Stonehenge. However, I am lucky enough to live nearby a lesser known, yet still incredibly important ancient henge site. On June the 18th, 1929, Wing Commander Insul was looking down from his aircraft at 2,000 foot in the air and noticed two concentric rings in the pasture field below. An archaeological dig in 1935 reveals this strange earthwork to be that of an ancient henge of incredible historic importance. The henge was carbon dated and found out to be around 4,500 years old making it considerably older than Stonehenge. Situated in Norfolk, with no reliable source of solid stone, only flint, the henge site used giant timber posts. Eight post holes were found, with carbonised oak remains, situated inside the innermost circle. The process of carbonising the bottoms of post holes is an ancient construction technique achieved by holding the timber over open fires burning them to prevent insects from eating the wood once they're placed in the earth, and lowering the chances of water ingress, therefore prolonging the wood against rot. The post holes were dug first, then the concentric rings were dug after, the centre circle being 41 metres in diameter and over 7 foot deep, and the more shallow outer ditch being roughly 80 metres in diameter and between 4 to 5 foot deep. The concentric rings both have a gap where a ramp would have been, facing westwards directly where the sun would set during the winter solstice, 
something which is no doubt a purposeful design. The Henge site is considered to be, possibly, the most important prehistoric site in all of East Anglia. Two large round barrows have been identified nearby, as well as a similar Henge-like monument only 900 metres away, and several Neolithic flint working stations. A key to the importance of this site lays in its geography. Arminghall Woodhenge lays narrowly south to where the River Taves and the River Yare meet. Although these rivers don't look like much today in this area, we know that these were much bigger thousands of years ago, thanks to Roman maps found. And indeed, these rivers were vital for everyday life during the time of when these henge sites were functioning. Another clue as to the importance of this area is just a short walk southwest, where the ruins of a Roman town, Venta Isnorum, nowadays known as Casus and Edmunds, can be found. Venta was the capital of East Anglia, made for the Iceni tribe by the Romans in 62 AD, following the end of Boudicca's rebellion. The Romano-British who lived here noted that the Henge was still in use by the local people, over 2,500 years after it was first built. Indeed, over 1,000 shards of Roman pottery have been found at the Arminghall Woodhenge, along with Iron Age, Bronze Age, and Neolithic shards of flint, pottery, and coins. We do not know when, or why, the Henge fell out of use. We can guess that after decades of Roman influence, the local Iceni and Trinovanti people slowly began to abandon their previous pagan deities, amalgamating into the newly Christian ways of life that had been spreading across Europe during this time. We do know, however, that the entire prehistoric valley of ancient monuments and the evident importance is woefully underappreciated within the archaeological world today, having little to no attention, which leaves so many unanswered questions and many undiscovered treasures. One thing we do know of prehistoric religious practices, specifically during the Bronze Age in Eastern England, is that the people who attended these ancient monument sites would often carry out a practice of gift-giving to their gods, by throwing artefacts such as jewellery, tools and pottery into rivers, of which the henges were often built upon the banks of. The most intriguing items were the tools. Whereas some artefacts would have been passed down through generations within families, it appears that tools were instead a popular religious offering. It is believed that tradesmen living in the Neolithic and Bronze Age would show their appreciation to their gods for allowing them to learn their skills, perhaps construction, pottery making or carpentry. But when these tradesmen came to the end of their working life, they would offer their tools back to the gods as if to offer thanks for a life of use. And now they are no longer needed, so they are handed back to the earth. A very beautiful thought, and highlights one of the reasons why many historians, archaeologists, and reenactors like myself have such a high respect for ancient history, even if such a thing cannot be proven with the utmost accuracy. Regardless, stone circles remain the grand example of the possibilities of early civilization. We may never know the daily or key functions of henges, and as such, they tend to fall into the category of, well, it's a ceremonial or ritual thing. However, I'd personally like to think that these places offer a social centre for village folk to gather round and discuss domestic politics, organise communal events such as feasts and festivals, and a familiar cultural hub, an epicentre of local tradition. We've explored the geography, the architecture, the industry, as well as briefly looking at what religion, life, and death meant to these people of Neolithic Britain. We have merely scratched the surface of what life was like 5,000 years ago. There is so much more to teach, and indeed so much more to discover about this Neolithic world, which is so different to the Britain we know today. For now, thanks for watching.